Good evening, everyone. If you're watching this, um, it means I wasn't able to join you live for this presentation, but I'm very excited to participate in this event. And uh, I'm looking forward to participating in the panel discussion um, later this evening. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen with you for this talk. Here we are. So I'll be presenting Health Equity in New York City, Local Perspectives Through a Global Surgery Lens. I'm Dr. Ernest Bartholomew. I'm currently the Chief Resident in Neurosurgery at Mount Sinai Hospital and Health System. And I wanna start by thanking the organizers of the Conscious Cities Festival 2020 for inviting me to participate in this very transformative event at a highly and uniquely teachable moment in our city's life. I have no financial disclosures for this talk and all opinions that I express are my own and do not necessarily represent the opinions or perspectives of my employer or institution. So after introducing myself briefly, um, I'll go through some of the ways that I went about exploring the racial and socioeconomic health disparities in New York City and specifically um, you know, whether or not uh, we do have uh, a health equity or health inequity problem, what the nature of that problem is, and uh, some prospects for transforming uh, local public health based on that exploration. So first about me, I'm the first born son of uh, Haitian immigrants. Both of my parents were born in a small town in the south of Haiti called Gangwev. And I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I've lived in uh, four of the five boroughs in New York. I haven't lived in Queens before. Uh, I'm pictured in the center here uh, with my colleagues in neurosurgery. These are some of my co-residents. So I'm in the seventh year of training in the seven year training program in neurosurgery at Mount Sinai. And uh, over to the right, you see me with my brilliant children, uh, Lukey and Josie. And then the other pictures are pictures that represent uh, the main reason I think I was invited to speak with you today. And that's my passion for global health and global surgery. During my elective time in neurosurgery residency, I got to spend two years at Harvard University as a Paul Farmer Global Surgery Research Fellow and also obtaining a master in public health degree in global health and public health leadership. So my passion in global surgery is uh, looking at how to expand access to safe and affordable and timely surgical care in not just Haiti, really all countries where, uh, where this is an issue. Um, I have a particular interest in a focus on Haiti uh, and in neurosurgery there, where we only have four neurosurgeons available to serve a population of 12 million people and people who daily die or are disabled uh, from preventable and treatable uh, surgical diseases like traumatic brain injury and stroke. So this is where most of my focus goes. And uh, when we talk about global surgery, um, you know, we're talking about a field that uh, really has come about uh, just in the past, you know, I would say five years in terms of the modern field of academic global surgery. Um, uh, certain uh, aspects of that field were practiced long before that. But in 2015, we uh, were given this guiding document by the report of the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, this uh, Global Surgery 2030 document that gave us a vision around universal access to safe, affordable surgical care, uh, as well as anesthesia and obstetric care, wherever uh, those services are needed. It gave us five key messages. It gave us indicators that countries could aim to achieve in order to uh, fulfill this vision, as well as a flexible template for uh, problem solving in the policy space around access to surgical care. And why this focus? Well, we discovered in this document that five out of seven people on the planet lack this access. So in an era where uh, you know, sustainable development goal number three is reminding us to make uh, universal access to basic healthcare services um, a reality, uh, here we are in a fundamental aspect of healthcare, um, not even achieving uh, that goal for, for surgery, obstetrics, and anesthesia. Um, and so uh, there's a gap to fill here. And uh, the, this document in The Lancet reminded us that surgery, obstetrics, and anesthesia are an indivisible and indispensable part of healthcare. 
So when we talk about global surgery, we have definitions um, that a number of people have put forth in recent years. And uh, this is one um, oft-cited definition. Uh, it is an area of study, research, practice, and advocacy that seeks to improve health outcomes and achieve health equity for all people who require surgical care with a special emphasis on underserved populations and populations in crisis. And it uses a number of uh, primarily academic, uh, you know, as well as policy methods to achieve those goals. So, you know, what do global surgery and global health have to do with health equity in New York City? And that's really why we're all here, I think, is exploring this question. And uh, what I'll remind us all is, you know, the reason to take a global health or global surgery lens and look at the issues we deal with here in New York is that it really is about all people. And the problems in global health and global surgery um, are called global because they're global in scope and not necessarily just because they are dealing with problems across national borders in other countries. So New York is definitely included here. And the first question is, is healthcare uh, in terms of access to surgery equitable in New York City? And I sought to answer this question by developing a survey for the purposes of this event uh, that was circulated to 35 of my colleagues and friends in the variety of medical specialties that you see here in this pie chart. Um, so evidently most of them come from neurosurgery and there were a number of medical students who participated, but uh, also many other specialties. And you know, I would say we have probably a few hundred years of collective uh, healthcare experience in New York City represented just in this pie chart here and by the participants in the survey um, who have by extension treated thousands and likely tens of thousands of patients in New York City. So um, I think we have an interesting uh, piece of the truth that may come through by looking at uh, what this cohort had to say about this issue. And I asked them to evaluate uh, the statement access to surgical care in New York City is equitable. Clearly the vast majority disagreed with this statement. 66% disagreed clearly, um, and then smaller percentages were either neutral or somewhat agreed, and then a much smaller percentage strongly agreed with the statement. So when we looked at the reasons for inequity, uh, what the respondents in the survey said is, well, health care in terms of access to surgery in New York City is inequitable because of differences in insurance status challenges in accessing higher tier care if you are poor. Uh, healthcare seems to vary a lot depending on which neighborhood in New York City you live in and what your socioeconomic status happens to be. Patients with lower socioeconomic status tend to face more barriers to care. Uh, issues of health literacy, for example, uh, come up as one of those barriers, uh, as well as other social determinants of health. Uh, emergency department overusage reflects the health inequality and inadequate representation of women and black men in surgical subspecialties also contributes to this inequity. There were many other reasons put forth by the cohort. Um, these were some of the ones that stood out and that were repeated in various forms by multiple respondents. So then I asked them, is healthcare in New York City inclusive? Interestingly, uh, the idea of inclusiveness or inclusion um, got somewhat more shared or divided um, responses with 14% uh, strongly disagreeing, 29% somewhat disagreeing, 17% being neutral, and then 29% agreeing that it is inclusive and then 11% strongly agreeing. So, um, so this same cohort felt that uh, by and large, healthcare is inequitable, but perhaps we were further along and further along in terms of inclusion in New York City than we were in terms of uh, health equity in New York City. And so, looking at some of the reasons put forth by the different sides of uh, of this conversation, uh, some of the reasons for disagreement were that the healthcare workforce is non-representative of New York City demographics. Uh, health insurance disparities and racial disparities contribute to the lack of inclusiveness and patients from lower socioeconomic status are less likely to consider surgical treatment because of high financial or time commitments. Some of the reasons for agreement included that 
patients were included in developing their health plans in the practices of the respondents. Uh, there are providers for all types of insurance. And if patients need surgery, the surgery can be scheduled. And interdisciplinary collaborations for optimizing patient care were common in the practices of some respondents. And then some of the neutral responses included uh, that it was dependent on location or dependent on institution, which perhaps suggests that if we're looking at the city as a whole, these respondents would feel that we aren't really inclusive uh, as a city, but some locations were perhaps more inclusive than others. So, you know, this study will continue. I thought it was very uh, insightful and interesting and people will continue to respond, but this is the beginning of uh, some of the thoughts that our city's healthcare providers um, provided <laughs> in, in response to this question. Um, evidence abounds uh, in terms of uh, being able to understand the, the inequity in New York City's surgical ecosystem. I'll just quickly go through some of the studies that, that uh, expose this. This 2016 study uh, looks at racial disparity in esophageal cancer and found that although surgery appeared to reduce mortality overall, early survival is worse for black patients than it is for white patients. And this was published in the Journal of Surgical Oncology. In terms of trauma, there are significant race, ethnicity, and uh, geographic and socioeconomic disparities in terms of access to urban trauma care. Uh, this study uh, looked at uh, three different cities, including New York City, and found that um, the black majority and the socioeconomically marginalized or poor uh, people tended to live further away from trauma centers than those who were in more socioeconomically advantaged uh, uh, households uh, or white patients. So um, more evidence directly from New York City in this article. And then this article looking at C-section delivery rates in uh, New York City hospitals and the associated neonatal outcomes, um, very telling. Uh, the evidence in this article demonstrates that uh, literally stepwise from the patient who is a Medicaid patient uh, getting treated in a pu public hospital to a patient who is a Medicaid patient in a private hospital to those in the most sort of uh, advantaged group, uh, private hospital, private insurance, uh, you could predict uh, whether or not uh, a patient was going to have access to a C-section. Uh, and there was a direct impact on neonatal outcomes. So people delivering uh, in public hospitals on Medicaid consistently had far worse neonatal outcomes um, as judged by the APGAR score less than seven um, compared to Medicaid patients in private hospitals and they were worse off compared to patients uh, in private hospitals with private insurance. Uh, many more such examples um, exist. Um, what about COVID-19 inequities? No, I won't speak about COVID-19 uh, in this talk, except to say that, you know, we started hearing about the tremendous racial um, disparity in terms of uh, gravity of illness and mortality due to COVID. And, you know, really, I think what some of the data I've shared here points to is that COVID is just one more illness pointing to much deeper and far reaching and long running uh, structural um, inequalities and inequities that are driving a lot of what we saw in the face of this pandemic. So what are the sources of these disparities? Um, there are many and it, it is multifactorial. I often do advance the idea that much of this is rooted in a colonial legacy. Um, a colonial legacy where institutions, um, our institutions here in New York, um, not only in healthcare, but also in education and uh, virtually every other major sphere of, uh, of New York City life were designed to benefit white men. Uh, and often through the exploitation of non-white, non-males. 
So this included the enslavement of African people, uh, oppression of people of African descent, subjugation of women, the systematic transfer of wealth to a privileged group, and, and much, much more. This is obviously a very extensive topic. Um, and yet, it's surprising to discover how often this is overlooked as a fundamental factor that has generated many of these inequalities. And so terms like structural racism and structural violence, which are terms from the uh, anthropology space that we've started to hear more recently um, with uh, the, the tragic uh, events surrounding George Floyd's death and Breonna Taylor's death and you know, some of the other uh, anti-Black violence that has really uh, come to national and international attention because of a democratized social media sphere. Um, many of these issues, which we know we've dealt with as far back as Jim Crow and, and prior, um, you know, they've been here, they never went away, um, but perhaps we're in a moment of elevated social consciousness about them and around them, um, given uh, social media and other things, and perhaps the political context that we're currently in. Um, and uh, that's another aspect of the source of these issues, the political, economic, and ideological warfare that has conditioned much of American life and New York City life for decades, such as the Cold War and the various sides of arguments around American capitalism and democracy uh, versus socialism and communism and the fear response that many people have uh, to many of these ideas and terms that often shuts down the possibility of looking at uh, ways of achieving multiple goals uh, ideologically that may not fit cleanly into any of these buckets. Um, and then health economics and the relationship of health economics to, to much of this warfare. You know, is health a public good or a private good? Um, the various market failures in medicine and healthcare. So I think these are some of the, the, the fundamental issues. There are many others. You know, what are some transformative solutions? Um, these are some of the solutions that were put forth in the survey. More public health programming and social media outreach, being more inclusive of other races, universal access to adequate health insurance, establishing rotating charity surgeries in hospitals, increased investment in public hospitals, diversify, the healthcare workforce, uh, reform reimbursement frameworks and appeal to congressional representatives. Um, and there's much more I uh, suspect and hope that we'll be able to uh, discuss these issues more in the panel discussion later today. Um, but you know, what really struck me reviewing a lot of these solutions is that many of these solutions are the solutions that are currently being pursued uh, in low and middle income countries like Haiti where uh, what's missing is a strong healthcare system that would obviate the need for such solutions. So, you know, I hope to offer that new perspective as a reflection uh, during a time when we're actually in the midst of a global health crisis. So some of the ideas and solutions of global health, even as global health um, is thought to be a, a, a discipline that also needs to be decolonized. Um, it does offer um, some useful perspectives and solutions that uh, may create new space for health equity and inclusion in New York City. So thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to the panel discussion later on. Take care.